morning. Let's cover a few announcements uh, before we uh, have a call to worship this morning. Uh, please note those in your, in your bulletin. Um, and one correction, <clears throat> you know, ladies, there's a couple of things for you there. There's a, a women in the church meeting tomorrow evening and then the ladies' Bible study on Wednesday. But note that it's lesson seven, not lesson eight. So just a slight correction there on the Bible study. Uh, also, know that the Thanksgiving dinner um, next Sunday at 6 p.m. And note that you don't have to bring any. So everything's provided. So anybody cooking Thanksgiving week, busy week, guess what? You get us started nice. You get a meal prepared for it. Uh, any other announcements this morning before we get started? Okay. If you'll stand with me now for our call to worship, any response to reading. And that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Now let's, let's bow to the invitation. Father, we... Uh, Sabbath day when we can gather together, Lord, this day of, of rest and, and of worship, Lord. And we just pray that, Lord, you would be with everything that's done today, Lord, to be honoring to you. We're thankful for uh, the time we've already spent together in Sunday school and, and the, the word was taught and, and we're, we're learning and, and growing. And we're just thankful now as we gather in the worship service, uh, Lord, uh, the word will be taught. Saying through hymns and, and Lord, as we uh, observe communion today, Lord, we just pray that you would prepare our hearts and our minds, and Lord, we would just, uh, Lord, seek, uh, Lord, you and, and, and all that you do, and may this time be honoring to you. And now we pray together, Lord, as you taught us to pray. <coughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, we'll take your hymnals now, our first hymn, number 115. And we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 5. 115.
together. Um, it is our practice when we're with Third Communion, we'll only uh, confess together the Nicene Creed. So you may want to have your bulletin in front of you as we, as we read together. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. our thanks again. Father in heaven, we bless you this morning because you are God, our creator. 
And you have been bountiful and kind in providing for our needs. You've supplied our deepest needs and, and given us abundance when you provide. And where we may be conscious of needs today, Lord, give us grace to believe that you will meet them and peace to trust you and to follow you. We thank you and bless you for the beauty of your creation and the changing seasons, the bright morning and a beautiful day. We thank you for the sun that you cause to shine each day. And we thank you for the spiritual light you give. You've shown into our hearts the light of the gospel of Christ. You give us your word to enlighten our path. You give us the spirit to show us the way to go. So we thank you for all of your blessings in creation and in providence and in our salvation. I pray that you would continue to sanctify us again. Give us that inner light through the word, the word speaking, the voice of the spirit guiding us as your people. And may there be that spiritual fervency that we would live out our calling as your people. And to that end, we give you these gifts, but a token of ourselves, a symbol of the dedication <coughs> of our heart and lives, take them and use them for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our worship by singing hymn 173. Praise him, praise him, hymn 173. this morning, and often we read these verses from 1 Corinthians 11 together before we observe the Lord's table. They warn us against partaking of uh, the bread and the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. So it's a call to examine ourselves, to make sure that we are in the faith and seeking to commune with God. Don't be over-conscientious. 
about what scripture calls us to do here. Sometimes folks read the words unworthy manner and they think, well, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I'm unworthy of God's grace. Perhaps I couldn't, shouldn't come and eat of the Lord's table. If we were to read this in context in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul has a lot there to say about how the body lives together, how they love each other, how they look out for one another, and warns a body that may be uh, taking advantage of one another to fix that, lest they incur judgment uh, from the Lord's table. But it's not this overwhelming warning of, did you sin this week? Then, then hold off. No, it's confess your sins to God. Pray for his grace. You want to commune with him and know him. And then come eat at the table in order to be strengthened. So let's read these verses together. And then we'll have a moment of silent prayer and then I'll lead us in a corporate prayer. Reading together. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Let's pray silently for a moment. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that were given to save us from our sins. I pray this morning as we come to the table, you would fill us with gratitude of your mercies towards us, that you would make us mindful of sin wherever we might be disconnected from one another or withholding reconciliation or forgiveness or thinking better of ourselves than we ought to think. A lot of the things uh, that we considered last week in Romans 12, then Lord, forgive us of those sins. Bring healing and reconciliation and closeness to us and may this communion table be a means to that end. And Father, we are also mindful of the sins that go on in our hearts or the temptations that no one else knows about and help us to flee any kind of hypocrisy, any kind of secret sin. Father, if there be something this morning that we need to make right with you or with another, well, may we be quick to do a business with God. That we thank you that you invite us to the table as we repent and as we believe and you offer this table to sinners that we might be spiritually strengthened. I pray this morning as we eat this simple meal in remembrance of you, that you would bless to that end. Thank you for our worship. Bless the choir as they come to sing. Continue with us, we pray, in Jesus' name. And hear God's word of pardon. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquity.
far. Turn with me this morning to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 in your New Testament scriptures. We've been making our way through this epistle all year, and we come this week to Romans chapter 13. I'm going to read the entire chapter, because I believe the three sections of the chapter hold together to give us one overall message. So Romans chapter 13, and I'll begin reading at verse 1 through the end of the chapter. God's word says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. That is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, rather Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we again come to this passage, or the word of God as we do each time we gather. And we ask for your help. We Thank you for the word. We love your word. Oh, what a delight it is to us day and night. So teach us how to understand and obey, obey your word and live it out with wisdom. And give us grace for whatever the spiritual need may be this morning. I pray we go out comforted by the Lord, encouraged by your truth, challenged and, and equipped to live as your people. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for several weeks since starting Romans 12, we've been talking about how Jesus' lordship produces a new world order. The opening paragraph of Romans as a whole declares that Jesus Christ our Lord was appointed the Son of God in power and is now calling the nations to obey the faith. And the central confession that all people need to make, Jews and Gentiles alike, is that Jesus is Lord. Those who make that confession become part of the new humanity. And they are being transformed by the renewing of their minds. 
And so the question that Christians might wonder about is, if I am a member of the true humanity, if I am a citizen of God's kingdom, how do I relate to this present world? You've got the old order of ways in Romans 1, but you have the new way of things here in Romans 12 and following. So as I live under Jesus' lordship, what does that look like in this life? Even more specifically, the statement that Jesus is Lord, that is quite a political statement. And the early Christians swore their allegiance to Jesus' lordship. And that's not something Caesar was particularly excited about. You can even read the Gospels to see how someone like Herod felt about a new king in his domain. So as we come to Romans 13 today, in verses 1 through 7, we have one of Paul's most extended statements about how Christians relate to the governments under which they live. And when Paul wrote this, Nero was on the throne. Now, Nero's earlier years did not feature the persecution that the later years did. One of his main advisors, Seneca, died, I believe. And after that, Nero's uh, sanity took quite a downward spiral. But nonetheless, even in his early years, he presided over a system that was unjust and arrogant. And his empire contained immorality and cruelty. How does Paul instruct Christians to relate to such a system? Well, Paul gives us a full answer in all of chapter 13. So while verses 1 through 7 focus on government, the rest of the chapter continues the answer. So I want us today to give our attention to the whole chapter where Paul shows us how we can live as citizens of God's kingdom on this earth. How can you live as a citizen of God's kingdom while you're on this earth? And Paul gives us three ways. The first is by respecting the government's authority in verses 1 through 7. Paul begins with a straightforward admonition. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. And governing authorities refers to those who have a position of authority over us. Now, the reference to taxes in verses 6 through 7 makes that authority quite specific. Paul is referring to civil or governmental authority. So I'm not going to be broadening his words beyond that. Paul imagines that Christians will recognize that certain people in government, certain governmental institutions, have authority over them, and that Christians will comply with their law. Now, some have wondered why Paul gives this admonition here in Romans. It almost seems to come out of nowhere. Well, the previous chapter ended with an admonition to avoid revenge and trust in God's judgment. So perhaps this passage continues that idea by saying you may be tempted to take revenge on evil rulers. But that is not the Christian way particularly knowing that persecution may come. Revenge is not how the Christians respond to that kind of government. Or perhaps he's encouraging the Christians that while they should not take vengeance themselves, they do have recourse to a system that is at least intended to keep the world from degenerating into chaos. Or... Perhaps he knows that some Christians are re tempted to reject the legitimacy of government because they are members of the new creation. And they think that they transcend such realities, particularly if they think those realities are evil. Think of, in some of Paul's other letters, he has to address those who were rejecting marriage. They thought, hey, I'm in the new creation, I've transcended those things, and I'm no longer part of that. Maybe Paul's writing to correct that. Whatever the reason, 
Paul reminds us that government structures are a legitimate part of God's world. In fact, as he says in the rest of verse 1, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. And I think Paul is saying two things here. First, the very idea of government is part of God's design. So one author writes, God wants his world to be ordered, not chaotic. Some government is always necessary in a world where evil flourishes when unchecked. And second, Paul is saying that the particular people who fill government offices are there as a result of God's providence. This is what Nebuchadnezzar came to learn in Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. The Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets them over the lowliest of people. So the idea is intended by God and the very people who fill the offices are there as a result of God's providence. That does not mean that God approves of every ruler's actions or that they can't be held accountable. So if you've studied history, you may remember the old idea of the divine right of kings. If God puts us in our position, then people may not question us. You won't find the scriptures going that far. But you will find the scriptures saying that God sovereignly controls who does and does not have political office. When people win an office... Ultimately, the cause is because God decreed it. When they lose one, God is ultimately the controller of that situation as well. And so, because of that, because God is the ultimate cause of human government, Paul warns in verse 2, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Uh, when people will not admit that government has a legitimate right to exercise authority, that is an attitude that brings God's judgment. And Paul could be saying here, okay, if you have that attitude, it will bring judgment from the governing authorities. He will speak to that in the next verses. But here he's probably talking about God's judgment. God holds people accountable who rebel against government. Now, verses 3 to 4 continue to encourage submission to the government, but they do it from a more positive angle. They read, For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. God has ordained government for a good purpose. To maintain order by restraining Evildoers. As we said earlier, God wants his world to be ordered, not chaotic. And whether they are aware of it or not, the government serves God. They are God's deacons. That's the actual word Paul uses in the original language. They're God's deacons, his servants, by punishing evildoers and restraining wickedness. And so because of that, Christians should endeavor to conduct themselves as obedient citizens, to be the kind of people who don't bring that trouble upon themselves. Quite simply, Christians should obey the law so they don't get into trouble. As Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, 2, we pray for our government leaders so that we may live, excuse me, so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And if we don't, 
we may find ourselves on the receiving end of legal punishment. And not only that, but as verse 5 tells us once more, our conscience should tell us that obeying the authorities is the right thing to do. So that's the overall ethic that Paul gives us when it comes to relating to government. And no doubt, Paul's words have perhaps raised some questions in your mind. Uh, many people have come to this passage and wondered, okay, Paul, how did you write these verses with a straight face? Have you seen the government under which you live? I, I couldn't help but chuckle uh, looking at the upcoming sermons. We began this series at the beginning of the new year. And of course, Romans 13 would happen uh, at this time of year. God has a great sense of humor. So perhaps we all have questions in our mind about how to relate to this passage. Well, as we've already said, Nero was on the throne when Paul wrote this. And Rome was far from being the ideal government that Paul seems to imagine here. Not only that, there have been many governments throughout the history of the world who have done the opposite of what this passage describes. They have punished those who do good and rewarded those who do evil. So you might think of later Roman persecution in the early church. Nazi Germany tends to be a textbook example. We could even think honestly about the treatment that blacks received in America during the civil rights era. And furthermore, in some situations, rulers, have, rulers in Christian government have used this passage to tell their people, hey, be quiet and do not resist abuse, even if the government is doing wrong. One example there would be the apartheid uh, regime over in South Africa a century or generations ago. So how do we apply the ideals of the passage in a real world situation? Well, here's what I want us to Avoid. I don't want us to come to a passage that seems hard to obey and hard to apply and maybe uncomfortable to apply and, and, and find some way around it. Okay, Paul said that, but here's what we could say based on these other statements. I don't want that to be our first instinct. I do think we can recognize that in this passage and in Scripture as a whole, Paul does not give absolute authority to human governments with submission to the absolute degree. So, for example, Paul himself, he was about to receive a flogging before being interrogated in Jerusalem, and he asked, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? What is Paul doing there? He is appealing to his rights. He could have even thought through, was he thinking of Jesus' words? You know, if, if they hurt you, just turn the other cheek or go the extra mile, perhaps. But in this situation, Paul appealed to his rights. Perhaps throughout this message, some of you have been thinking about Acts 5.29, where the religious authorities forbade the apostles from preaching about Jesus. Now, granted, that was a religious structure, not strictly a government authority, but nonetheless, the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings, and that's good counsel. The Christian's first allegiance is always to Jesus the Lord. And not only that, the whole Old Testament has a rich prophetic tradition in which God's people admonish earthly rulers to avoid unjust and immoral reigns. And God's people in the church through, throughout history, they, they have a long track record of speaking up on behalf of, for example, the unborn, or the poor and the marginalized, foreigners, that, that's a long-standing Christian tradition, caring for foreigners, those without civil rights, those who are unfairly incarcerated, again, Christians working in prison reform goes back hundreds of years. Even further than that, into the Middle Ages and the early church, you have Christians working for those who do not have access to medical care. And we could go on and on. Christians should not be silent in the face of injustice or wickedness. 
However, what I don't see Paul doing here is giving every individual the right to circumvent the Bible's teaching because they've decided the government's too wicked or the government's too powerful and therefore the government is illegitimate. Listen to what one author writes. It's a little longer quote, but I think it's worth reading in full. Christians who were regarded as the scum of the earth in Rome at the time, must not get an additional reputation as troublemakers. No good will come to the cause of the gospel by followers of Jesus being regarded as dissidents who won't cooperate with the most basic social mechanisms. Paul is anxious precisely because he believes that Jesus is the true Lord of the world, that his followers should not pick unnecessary quarrels with the lesser lords. They are indeed, Christians are indeed a revolutionary community. But if they go for the normal type of violent revolution, they will just be paying the empire back at its own game. They will certainly lose, and much worse, the gospel itself will lose with them. So I think that should land with us in an encouraging way. We think Jesus is Lord, and sometimes Christians think that, okay, and I need to press those claims of lordship onto the earthly rulers. At the same time, the other way you could approach that is, hey, if my first allegiance is to Jesus as Lord, then I would not give my primary focus to maintaining an earthly kingdom. I would live in such a way that the gospel is the gospel is preeminent in my life, not my political loyalties. And I have found sometimes talking that some Christians spend probably too much time thinking and talking about the government. And it interferes with their ability to be a witness for Christ. And furthermore, it tempts them to be antagonistic with those with whom they disagree politically. That person starts becoming your enemy and the other person. And so I would just encourage all of you, if what you watch or listen to all day makes it where you can't love others or obey this passage, then consider reducing your intake. Because we have a first loyalty to Jesus and his good news of the gospel. That's why we're all still here to bear witness to that goodness, while still living responsibly in this world. And so Paul concludes this section with verses 6 through 7. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Paul may give the specific application of paying taxes because that's a pretty strong acknowledgement that government has authority over you when you give them your money. Or maybe he just knows what all of us know, that taxes are a perennial source of aggravation to people. And so he wants us to know, hey, even that practice is a means by which we give honor to whom honor is due. So how can I live as a citizen of God's kingdom on earth? By respecting government authority. Now, Paul gives two more ways to live as citizens of God's kingdom. I want to look at them today because they flow from what Paul says about government. We'll hit these two much quicker than we did the opening verses because it's just the big ideas that matter here in the rest of the chapter. Here's another way to live as a citizen of God's kingdom on earth. By making love your highest priority. So after discussing taxes, Paul says this in verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. So we have an obligation to give everyone what we owe them, verse 7, and we also have the obligation, the debt, to love one another, verses 8, 9, and 10. In fact, this is a debt, Paul says, that you'll never pay off. But in this instance, that's a good thing. Because whoever loves 
others has fulfilled the law. And we said a lot about love last week when looking at chapter 12. Paul returns to it here in chapter 13. Maybe he needs to sandwich his comments about the government with commands to love. Yes, you have the government to deal with. But what really matters in God's kingdom is love. Let that be where Christians are investing their energy. And what does it mean that love fulfills the law? Well, in verse 9, Paul cites four of the Ten Commandments and then says, And whatever other commandment there may be, they are all summed up in this one command, Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul looks at these commands, which are all about how we treat one another, and he says, the law wants you to love one another. And, and when you keep those commands, you are doing what the law intended. You see, one of Paul's big goals for writing Romans as a whole was to address concerns that Christians are lawless. Some Jews may have worried, okay, does Paul's gospel give believers a license to sin? Perhaps some of the Roman authorities were concerned that Christians would be bad for society. Paul is saying you don't have to worry about that because Christians are people of love. And since they love each other, they do no wrong to one another or to anyone else for that matter. At least that's the witness Paul intends for Christians to have. And one more way that we live out our heavenly citizenship in this world by focusing your attention on the return of Jesus. Paul gives this overall admonition in verses 11 and 12. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Paul is looking at history in terms of night and day. And he knows the day has already dawned. The day of the new world order where Christ reigns as Lord. But he also knows the night is not yet completely over. It's nearly over. But the Christian finds himself in between the end of the old world and the full dawn of Christ's kingdom. How then should we live, as Francis Schaeffer asked years ago, as those who cast off the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light? And Paul begins to close by giving us specific examples of what that life is looks like, verse 13, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. We're not enslaved to our passions. We don't use other people's bodies for our own gratification, and we don't live in conflict with others. And if you wonder, yeah, how then does that connect with the opening of the chapter and Paul's instructions about government? I think Paul is saying this, don't get overly fixated on the affairs of this world, but look forward to the return of Christ. As Jesus often said when he would be asked tricky questions about legal matters, he just said, hey, come follow me. And I think Paul is saying there's a kingdom that's already begun and it will soon fully appear. You need to get dressed up for that. You need to become the kind of person now that inhabits that kingdom when it comes. Don't get too caught up on what's going on in the rest of the world. Put your eyes on the horizon of Christ's appearance. So friends, Jesus is king the world is disordered and rebellious, and government has a legitimate function to restrain that. But no government will do that ideally. No government will ever give you eternal salvation or satisfaction of your soul now. <clears throat> Jesus is the world's true king. He will give you that. He came to rescue those 
who had rebelled against them. And he did it not to give them power, but to make them loving and pure. And we can live as those kinds of kingdom citizens, even on this earth. So let's pray to that end. Pray with me now. Father in heaven, we do thank you for Jesus the Lord, who though he was conquered and crushed, by injustice and sin, rose victoriously to defeat the evil 